Part Six, Chapter Five of Crime and Punishment by Fyodor Dostoevsky, translated by Constance Garnett, 1861 to 1946. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part Six, Chapter Five. Raskolnikov walked after him. What's this? cried Svidrigailov, turning round. I thought I said. It means that I am not going to lose sight of you now. What? Both stood still and gazed at one another as though measuring their strength. From all your half tipsy stories, Raskolnikov observed harshly, I am positive that you have not given up your designs on my sister, but are pursuing them more actively than ever. I have learnt that my sister received a letter this morning. You have hardly been able to sit still all this time. You may have unearthed a wife on the way, but that means nothing. I should like to make certain myself." Raskolnikov could hardly have said himself what he wanted and of what he wished to make certain. "'Upon my word! I'll call the police!' "'Call away!' Again they stood for a minute facing each other. At last Svidrigailov's face changed. Having satisfied himself that Raskolnikov was not frightened at his threat, he assumed a mirthful and friendly air. "'What a fellow! I purposely refrain from referring to your affair, though I am devoured by curiosity. It's a fantastic affair. I've put it off till another time, but you're enough to rouse the dead. Well, let us go. Only, I warn you beforehand, I am only going home for a moment, to get some money. Then I shall lock up the flat, take a cab, and go to spend the evening at the islands. Now, now, are you going to follow me? I'm coming to your lodgings not to see you but Sofia Semyonovna, to say I'm sorry not to have been at the funeral. That's as you like, but Sofia Semyonovna is not at home. She has taken the three children to an old lady of high rank, the patroness of some orphan asylums, whom I used to know years ago. I charm the old lady by depositing a sum of money with her to provide for the three children of Katerina Ivanovna, and subscribing to the institution as well. I told her, too, the story of Sofia Semyonovna in full detail, suppressing nothing. It produced an indescribable effect on her. That's why Sofia Semyonovna has been invited to call today at the X Hotel, where the lady is staying for the time. No matter, I'll come all the same. As you like, it's nothing to me, but I won't come with you. Here we are at home. By the way, I am convinced that you regard me with suspicion just because I have shown such delicacy and have not so far troubled you with questions. You understand? It struck you as extraordinary. I don't mind betting it's that. Well, it teaches one to show delicacy. And to listen at doors. Ah, that's it, is it? laughed Svidrigailov. Yes, I should have been surprised if you had let that pass after all that has happened. Ha <laughs> ha! Though I did understand something of the pranks you had been up to and were telling Sofia Semyonovna about, what was the meaning of it? Perhaps I am quite behind the times and can't understand. For goodness' sake, explain it, my dear boy. Expound the latest theories. You couldn't have heard anything. You're making it all up. But I'm not talking about that, though I did hear something. No, I'm talking of the way you keep sighing and groaning now. The shiller in you is in revolt every moment, and now you tell me not to listen at doors. If that's how you feel, go and inform the police that you had this mischance. You made a little mistake in your theory. But if you are convinced that one mustn't listen at doors, but one may murder old women at one's pleasure, you'd better be off to America and make haste. Run, young man. There may still be time. I'm speaking sincerely. Haven't you the money? I'll give you the fare." "'I'm not thinking of that at all,' Raskolnikov interrupted with disgust. "'I understand. But don't put yourself out. Don't discuss it if you don't want to. I understand the questions you are worrying over. Moral ones, aren't they? Duties of citizen and man? Lay them all aside. They are nothing to you now, ha <laughs> ha. You'll say you are still a man and a citizen. If so, you ought not to have got into this coil. It's no use taking up a job you are not fit for. 
Well, you'd better shoot yourself, or don't you want to?" You seem trying to enrage me, to make me leave you. What a queer fellow! But here we are. Welcome to the staircase. You see, that's the way to Sofia Semyonovna. Look, there is no one at home. Don't you believe me? Ask Kapernomov. She leaves the key with him. Here is Madame de Kapernomov herself. Hey, what? She is rather deaf. Has she gone out? Where? Did you hear? She is not in and won't be till late in the evening, probably. Well, come to my room. You wanted to come and see me, didn't you? Here we are. Madame Reslich is not at home. She is a woman who is always busy, an excellent woman, I assure you. She might have been of use to you if you had been a little more sensible. Now see. I take this five per cent bond out of the bureau. See what a lot I've got of them still. This one will be turned into cash today. I mustn't waste any more time. The bureau is locked, the flat is locked, and here we are again on the stairs. Shall we take a cab? I'm going to the islands. Would you like a lift? I'll take this carriage. Ah, you refuse? You are tired of it. Come for a drive. I believe it will come on to rain. Never mind, we'll put down the hood." Svidrigailov was already in the carriage. Raskolnikov decided that his suspicions were at least for that moment unjust. Without answering a word he turned and walked back towards the haymarket. If he had only turned round on his way he might have seen Svidrigailov get out not a hundred paces off, dismiss the cab and walk along the pavement. But he had turned the corner and could see nothing. Intense disgust drew him away from Svidrigailov. To think that I could for one instant have looked for help from that coarse brute, that depraved sensualist and blackguard, he cried. Raskolnikov's judgment was uttered too lightly and hastily. There was something about Svidrigailov which gave him a certain original, even a mysterious character. As concerned his sister, Raskolnikov was convinced that Svidrigailov would not leave her in peace. But it was too tiresome and unbearable to go on thinking and thinking about this. When he was alone he had not gone twenty paces before he sank, as usual, into deep thought. On the bridge he stood by the railing and began gazing at the water. And his sister was standing close by him. He met her at the entrance to the bridge, but passed by without seeing her. Donya had never met him like this in the street before and was struck with dismay. She stood still and did not know whether to call to him or not. Suddenly she saw Svidrigailov coming quickly from the direction of the haymarket. He seemed to be approaching cautiously. He did not go on to the bridge, but stood aside on the pavement, doing all he could to avoid Raskolnikov seeing him. He had observed Donya for some time and had been making signs to her. She fancied he was signaling to beg her not to speak to her brother, but to come to him. That's what Donya did. She stole by her brother and went up to Svidrigailov. "'Let us make haste away,' Svidrigailov whispered to her. "'I don't want Rodion Romanovich to know of our meeting. I must tell you I've been sitting with him in the restaurant close by, where he looked me up and I had great difficulty in getting rid of him.' He has somehow heard of my letter to you and suspects something. It wasn't you who told him, of course, but if not you, who then?" "'Well, we've turned the corner now,' Donya interrupted, "'and my brother won't see us. I have to tell you that I am going no further with you. Speak to me here. You can tell it all in the street.' "'In the first place, I can't say it in the street. Secondly, you must hear Sofia Semyonovna, too. And thirdly, I will show you some papers." Oh, well, if you won't agree to come with me, I shall refuse to give any explanation and go away at once. But I beg you not to forget that a very curious secret of your beloved brother's is entirely in my keeping." Donya stood still, hesitating, and looked at Svidrigailov with searching eyes. "'What are you afraid of?' he observed quietly. "'The town is not the country and even in the country you did me more harm than I did you." "'Have you prepared Sofia Semyonovna?" "'No, I have not said a word to her, and I'm not quite certain whether she is at home now, but most likely she is. 
She has buried her stepmother today. She is not likely to go visiting on such a day. For the time I don't want to speak to anyone about it, and I half regret having spoken to you. The slightest indiscretion is as bad as betrayal in a thing like this. I live in that house, we are coming to it. That's the porter of our house, he knows me very well. You see, he's bowing. He sees I'm coming with a lady, and no doubt he has noticed your face already, and you will be glad of that if you are afraid of me and suspicious. Excuse my putting things so coarsely. I haven't a flat to myself. Sofia Semyonovna's room is next to mine, she lodges in the next flat. The whole floor is let out in lodgings. Why are you frightened like a child? Am I really so terrible?" Svidrigailov's lips were twisted in a condescending smile, but he was in no smiling mood. His heart was throbbing and he could scarcely breathe. He spoke rather loud to cover his growing excitement. But Donia did not notice this peculiar excitement. She was so irritated by his remark that she was frightened of him like a child and that he was so terrible to her. Though I know you are not a man of honor, I am not in the least afraid of you. Lead the way," she said with apparent composure, but her face was very pale. Svidrigailov stopped at Sonia's room. Allow me to inquire whether she is at home. She is not. How unfortunate! But I know she may come quite soon. If she's gone out, it can only be to see a lady about the orphans. Their mother is dead. I've been meddling and making arrangements for them. If Sofia Semyonovna does not come back in ten minutes, I will send her to you, today if you like. This is my flat. These are my two rooms. Madame Reslich, my landlady, has the next room. Now look this way. I will show you my chief piece of evidence. This door from my bedroom leads into two perfectly empty rooms, which are to let. Here they are. You must look into them with some attention. Svidrigailov occupied two fairly large furnished rooms. Donia was looking about her mistrustfully, but saw nothing special in the furniture or position of the rooms. Yet there was something to observe, for instance, that Svidrigailov's flat was exactly between two sets of almost uninhabited apartments. His rooms are not entered directly from the passage, but through the landlady's two almost empty rooms. Unlocking a door leading out of his bedroom, Svidrigailov showed Donia the two empty rooms that were to let. Donia stopped in the doorway, not knowing what she was called to look upon, but Svidrigailov hastened to explain. Look here, at this second large room. Notice that door, it's locked. By the door stands a chair, the only one in the two rooms. I brought it from my room so as to listen more conveniently. Just the other side of the door is Sofia Semyonovna's table. She sat there talking to Rodion Romanovich. And I sat here listening on two successive evenings, for two hours each time, and of course I was able to learn something. What do you think?" You listened? Yes, I did. Now come back to my room. We can't sit down here. He brought Avdotya Romanovna back into his sitting-room and offered her a chair. He sat down at the opposite side of the table, at least seven feet from her but probably there was the same glow in his eyes which had once frightened Donia so much. She shuddered and once more looked about her distrustfully. It was an involuntary gesture. She evidently did not wish to betray her uneasiness. But the secluded position of Svidrigailov's lodging had suddenly struck her. She wanted to ask whether his landlady at least were at home, but pride kept her from asking. Moreover, she had another trouble in her heart incomparably greater than fear for herself. She was in great distress. "'Here is your letter,' she said, laying it on the table. "'Can it be true what you write? You hint at a crime committed, you say, by my brother. You hint at it too clearly. You daren't deny it now. I must tell you that I'd heard of this stupid story before you wrote, and don't believe a word of it. It's a disgusting and ridiculous suspicion. I know the story, and why and how it was invented. You can have no proofs. You promise to prove it. Speak. But let me warn you that I don't believe you. I don't believe you." Donia said this, speaking hurriedly, and for an instant the color rushed to her face. If you didn't believe it, 
how could you risk coming alone to my rooms? Why have you come? Simply from curiosity? Don't torment me. Speak, speak!" There's no denying that you are a brave girl. Upon my word, I thought you would have asked Mr. Resumian to escort you here. But he was not with you, nor anywhere near. I was on the lookout. It's spirited of you, it proves you wanted to spare Rodion Romanovich. But everything is divine in you. About your brother, what am I to say to you? You've just seen him yourself. What did you think of him? Surely that's not the only thing you are building on. No, not that, but on his own words. He came here on two successive evenings to see Sofia Semyonovna. I've shown you where they sat. He made a full confession to her. He is a murderer. He killed an old woman, a pawnbroker, with whom he had pawned things himself. He killed her sister, too, a peddler woman called Lizaveta, who happened to come in while he was murdering her sister. He killed them with an axe he brought with him. He murdered them to rob them, and he did rob them. He took money and various things. He told all this, word for word, to Sofia Semyonovna, the only person who knows his secret. But she has had no share by word or deed in the murder. She was as horrified at it as you are now. Don't be anxious. She won't betray him." "'It cannot be,' muttered Donya, with white lips. She gasped for breath. "'It cannot be. There was not the slightest cause, no sort of ground. It's a lie, a lie!' He robbed her. That was the cause. He took money and things. It's true that by his own admission he made no use of the money or things, but hid them under a stone, where they are now. But that was because he dared not make use of them. "'But how could he steal, rob? How could he dream of it?' cried Donya, and she jumped up from the chair. "'Why, you know him, and you've seen him. Can he be a thief?' She seemed to be imploring Svidrigailov. She had entirely forgotten her fear. There are thousands and millions of combinations and possibilities, Avdotya Romanovna. A thief steals and knows he's a scoundrel. But I've heard of a gentleman who broke open the mail. Who knows? Very likely he thought he was doing a gentlemanly thing. Of course, I should not have believed it myself, if I'd been told of it as you have, but I believe my own ears. He explained all the causes of it to Sofia Semyonovna, too, but she did not believe her ears at first. Yet she believed her own eyes at last. What were the causes? It's a long story, Avdotya Romanovna. Here's, how shall I tell you, a theory of sort, the same one by which I, for instance, consider that a single misdeed is permissible if the principal aim is right, a solitary wrongdoing and hundreds of good deeds. It's galling, too, of course, for a young man of gifts and overweening pride to know that if he had, for instance, a paltry three thousand, his whole career, his whole future would be differently shaped, and yet not to have that three thousand. Add to that nervous irritability from hunger, from lodging in a hole, from rags, from a vivid sense of the charm of his social position and his sister's and mother's position too. Above all, vanity, pride and vanity though goodness knows he may have good qualities, too. I am not blaming him, please don't think it. Besides, it's not my business. A special little theory came in, too. A theory of a sort. Dividing mankind, you see, into material and superior persons. That is, persons to whom the law does not apply, owing to their superiority, who make laws for the rest of mankind, the material, that is. It's all right as a theory un theory comme un autre. Napoleon attracted him tremendously, that is, what affected him was that a great many men of genius have not hesitated at wrongdoing, but have overstepped the law without thinking about it. He seems to have fancied that he was a genius too, that is, he was convinced of it for a time. He has suffered a great deal, and is still suffering from the idea that he could make a theory but was incapable of boldly overstepping the law, and so he is not a man of genius. And that's humiliating for a young man of any pride, in our day especially." "'But remorse? You deny him any moral feeling, then? Is he like that?' 
Ah, Avdotya Romanovna, everything is in a muddle now. Not that it was ever in very good order. Russians in general are broad in their ideas, Avdotya Romanovna, broad like their land, and exceedingly disposed to the fantastic, the chaotic. But it's a misfortune to be broad without a special genius. Do you remember what a lot of talk we had together on this subject, sitting in the evenings on the terrace after supper? Why, you used to reproach me with breadth. Who knows, perhaps we were talking at the very time when he was lying here thinking over his plan. There are no sacred traditions amongst us, especially in the educated class, Avdotya Romanovna. At the best, someone will make them up somehow for himself, out of books, or from some old chronicle. But those are, for the most part, the learned and all old fogies, so that it would be almost ill-bred in a man of society. You know my opinions in general, though. I never blame anyone. I do nothing at all. I persevere in that. But we've talked of this more than once before. I was so happy indeed as to interest you in my opinions. You are very pale, Avdotya Romanovna." I know his theory. I read that article of his about men to whom all is permitted. Razumian brought it to me. Mr. Razumian, your brother's article? In a magazine? Is there such an article? I didn't know. It must be interesting. But where are you going, Avdotya Romanovna? I want to see Sofia Semyonovna, Donya articulated faintly. How do I get to her? She has come in, perhaps. I must see her at once. Perhaps she... Avdotya Romanovna could not finish. Her breath literally failed her. Sofia Semyonovna will not be back till night, at least I believe not. She was to have been back at once, but if not, then she will not be in till quite late. Ah, then you are lying. I see. You were lying, lying all the time. I don't believe you. I don't believe you!" cried Donya, completely losing her head. Almost fainting, she sank onto a chair which Svidrigailov made haste to give her. Avdotya Romanovna, what is it? Control yourself. Here is some water. Drink a little." He sprinkled some water over her. Donya shuddered and came to herself. "'It has acted violently,' Svidrigailov muttered to himself, frowning. Avdotya Romanovna, calm yourself. Believe me, he has friends. We will save him. Would you like me to take him abroad? I have money. I can get a ticket in three days. And as for the murder, he will do all sorts of good deeds yet to atone for it. Calm yourself. He may become a great man yet. Well, how are you? How do you feel? Cruel man! To be able to jeer at it! Let me go! Where are you going? To him. Where is he? Do you know? Why is this door locked? We came in at that door and now it is locked. When did you manage to lock it? We couldn't be shouting all over the flat on such a subject. I am far from jeering. It's simply that I am sick of talking like this. But how can you go in such a state? Do you want to betray him? You will drive him to fury, and he will give himself up. Let me tell you, he is already being watched. They are already on his track. You will simply be giving him away. Wait a little. I saw him and was talking to him just now. He can still be saved. Wait a bit. Sit down. Let us think it over together. I asked you to come in in order to discuss it alone with you and to consider it thoroughly. But do sit down. How can you save him? Can he really be saved? Donya sat down. Svidrigailov sat down beside her. It all depends on you, on you, on you alone, he began with glowing eyes, almost in a whisper, and hardly able to utter the words for emotion. Donya drew back from him in alarm. He too was trembling all over. You, one word from you, and he is saved. I, I'll save him. I have money and friends. I'll send him away at once. I'll get a passport, two passports, one for him and one for me. I have friends, capable people. If you like, I'll take a passport for you, for your mother. What do you want with Razumian? 
I love you too. I love you beyond everything. Let me kiss the hem of your dress. Let me, let me. The very rustle of it is too much for me. Tell me, do that, and I'll do it. I'll do everything. I will do the impossible. What you believe, I will believe. I'll do anything, anything. Don't, don't look at me like that. Do you know that you are killing me?" He was almost beginning to rave. Something seemed suddenly to go in his head. Donia jumped up and rushed to the door. "'Open it! Open it!' she called, shaking at the door. "'Open it! Is there no one there?' Zvidrigailov got up and came to himself. His still trembling lips slowly broke into an angry, mocking smile. "'There is no one at home,' he said quietly and emphatically. The landlady has gone out, and it's a waste of time to shout like that. You are only exciting yourself uselessly. Where is the key? Open the door at once, at once, base man! I have lost the key and cannot find it." "'This is an outrage!' cried Donia, turning pale as death. She rushed to the furthest corner, where she made haste to barricade herself with a little table. She did not scream but she fixed her eyes on her tormentor and watched every movement he made. Zvidrigailov remained standing at the other end of the room facing her. He was positively composed, at least in appearance, but his face was pale as before. The mocking smile did not leave his face. "'You spoke of outrage just now, Avdotya Romanovna. In that case you may be sure I've taken measures. Sofia Semyonovna is not at home. The Kapernomovs are far away. There are five locked rooms between. I am at least twice as strong as you are, and I have nothing to fear, besides. For you could not complain afterwards. You surely would not be willing actually to betray your brother. Besides, no one would believe you. How should a girl have come alone to visit a solitary man in his lodgings? So that even if you do sacrifice your brother, you could prove nothing. It is very difficult to prove an assault, Avdotya Romanovna. Scoundrel! whispered Donia indignantly. As you like. But observe, I was only speaking by way of a general proposition. It's my personal conviction that you are perfectly right. Violence is hateful. I only spoke to show you that you need have no remorse, even if you were willing to save your brother of your own accord, as I suggest to you. You would simply be submitting to circumstances, to violence, in fact, if we must use that word. Think about it. Your brother's and your mother's fate are in your hands. I will be your slave, all my life. I will wait here." Svidrigailov sat down on the sofa about eight steps from Donia. She had not the slightest doubt now of his unbending determination. Besides, she knew him. Suddenly she pulled out of her pocket a revolver, cocked it, and laid it in her hand on the table. Svidrigailov jumped up. Aha! So that's it, is it?" he cried, surprised but smiling maliciously. Well, that completely alters the aspect of affairs. You've made things wonderfully easier for me, Avdotya Romanovna. But where did you get the revolver? Was it Mr. Razumian? Why, it's my revolver, an old friend! And how I've hunted for it! The shooting lessons I've given you in the country have not been thrown away. It's not your revolver. It belonged to Marfa Petrovna, whom you killed, wretch. There was nothing of yours in her house. I took it when I began to suspect what you were capable of. If you dare to advance one step, I swear I'll kill you." She was frantic. "'But your brother? I ask from curiosity,' said Svidrigailov, still standing where he was. "'Inform if you want to. Don't stir. Don't come nearer. I'll shoot. You poisoned your wife, I know. You are a murderer yourself." She held the revolver ready. "'Are you so positive I poisoned Marfa Petrovna?' "'You did. You hinted it yourself. You talked to me of poison. I know you went to get it. You had it in readiness. It was your doing. It must have been your doing. Scoundrel!' "'Even if that were true, it would have been for your sake you would have been the cause. You are lying. I hated you always, always." Oh ho, Avdotya Romanovna! 
You seem to have forgotten how you softened to me in the heat of propaganda. I saw it in your eyes. Do you remember that moonlight night, when the nightingale was singing?" "'That's a lie!' There was a flash of fury in Donia's eyes. "'That's a lie and a libel!' "'A lie? Well, if you like, it's a lie. I made it up. Women ought not to be reminded of such things.' He smiled. "'I know you will shoot, you pretty wild creature. Well, shoot away!' Donia raised the revolver, and deadly pale, gazed at him, measuring the distance and awaiting the first movement on his part. Her lower lip was white and quivering and her big black eyes flashed like fire. He had never seen her so handsome. The fire glowing in her eyes at the moment she raised the revolver seemed to kindle him and there was a pang of anguish in his heart. He took a step forward and a shot rang out. The bullet grazed his hair and flew into the wall behind. He stood still and laughed softly. The wasp has stung me. She aimed straight at my head. What's this? Blood? He pulled out his handkerchief to wipe the blood, which flowed in a thin stream down his right temple. The bullet seemed to have just grazed the skin. Donya lowered the revolver and looked at Svidrigailov, not so much in terror as in a sort of wild amazement. She seemed not to understand what she was doing and what was going on. "'Well, you missed. Fire again. I'll wait,' said Svidrigailov softly, still smiling, but gloomily. "'If you go on like that, I shall have time to seize you before you cock again.' Donya started, quickly cocked the pistol, and again raised it. "'Let me be!' she cried in despair. "'I swear I'll shoot again. I—' I'll kill you!" Well, at three paces you can hardly help it. But if you don't, then— His eyes flashed, and he took two steps forward. Donya shot again. It missed fire. You haven't loaded it properly. Never mind, you have another charge there. Get it ready. I'll wait. He stood facing her, two paces away, waiting and gazing at her with wild determination with feverishly passionate, stubborn, set eyes. Donia saw that he would sooner die than let her go. And, now, of course, she would kill him, at two paces. Suddenly she flung away the revolver. "'She's dropped it,' said Svidrigailov with surprise, and he drew a deep breath. A weight seemed to have rolled from his heart, perhaps not only the fear of death. Indeed, he may scarcely have felt it at that moment. It was the deliverance from another feeling, darker and more bitter, which he could not himself have defined. He went to Donia and gently put his arm around her waist. She did not resist, but, trembling like a leaf, looked at him with suppliant eyes. He tried to say something, but his lips moved without being able to utter a sound. "'Let me go,' Donia implored. Svidrigailov shuddered. Her voice was now quite different. Then you don't love me? he asked softly. Donya shook her head. And. and you can't? Never? he whispered in despair. Never. There followed a moment of terrible, dumb struggle in the heart of Svidrigailov. He looked at her with an indescribable gaze. Suddenly he withdrew his arm, turned quickly to the window, and stood facing it. Another moment passed. Here's the key." He took it out of the left pocket of his coat and laid it on the table behind him, without turning or looking at Donia. "'Take it. Make haste.' He looked stubbornly out of the window. Donia went up to the table to take the key. "'Make haste. Make haste,' repeated Svidrigailov, still without turning or moving. But there seemed a terrible significance in the tone of that make haste. Donia understood it snatched up the key, flew to the door, unlocked it quickly and rushed out of the room. A minute later, beside herself, she ran out onto the canal bank in the direction of X Bridge. Svidrigailov remained three minutes standing at the window. At last he slowly turned, looked about him, and passed his hand over his forehead. A strange smile contorted his face, a pitiful, sad, weak smile, 
a smile of despair. The blood, which was already getting dry, smeared his hand. He looked angrily at it, then wetted a towel and washed his temple. The revolver which Donia had flung away lay near the door and suddenly caught his eye. He picked it up and examined it. It was a little pocket three-barrel revolver of old-fashioned construction. There were still two charges and one capsule left in it. It could be fired again. He thought a little, put the revolver in his pocket, took his hat, and went out. End of Part 6 Chapter 5Part Six, Chapter Six of Crime and Punishment by Fyodor Dostoevsky, translated by Constance Garnett, eighteen sixty one to nineteen forty six. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part Six, Chapter Six. He spent that evening till ten o'clock, going from one low haunt to another. Katya too turned up and sang another gutter song. How a certain villain and tyrant began kissing Katya. Zvidrigailov treated Katya and the organ-grinder and some singers and the waiters and two little clerks. He was particularly drawn to these clerks by the fact that they both had crooked noses, one bent to the left and the other to the right. They took him finally to a pleasure garden, where he paid for their entrance. There was one lanky three-year-old pine-tree and three bushes in the garden, besides a vauxhall, which was in reality a drinking bar where tea too was served, and there were a few green tables and chairs standing round it. A chorus of wretched singers and a drunken but exceedingly depressed German clown from Munich, with a red nose, entertained the public. The clerks quarrelled with some other clerks, and a fight seemed imminent. Svidrigailov was chosen to decide the dispute. He listened to them for a quarter of an hour, but they shouted so loud that there was no possibility of understanding them. The only fact that seemed certain was that one of them had stolen something, and had even succeeded in selling it on the spot to a Jew, but would not share the spoil with his companion. Finally, it appeared that the stolen object was a teaspoon belonging to the Vauxhall. It was missed, and the affair began to seem troublesome. Svidrigailov paid for the spoon, got up, and walked out of the garden. It was about six o'clock. He had not drunk a drop of wine all this time and had ordered tea more for the sake of appearances than anything. It was a dark and stifling evening. Threatening storm-clouds came over the sky about ten o'clock. There was a clap of thunder and the rain came down like a waterfall. The water fell not in drops, but beat on the earth in streams. There were flashes of lightning every minute and each flash lasted while one could count five. Drenched to the skin, he went home, locked himself in, opened the bureau, took out all his money and tore up two or three papers. Then, putting the money in his pocket, he was about to change clothes, but looking out of the window and listening to the thunder and the rain, he gave up the idea, took up his hat and went out of the room without locking the door. He went straight to Sonia. She was at home. She was not alone. The four Kapernaumov children were with her she was giving them tea. She received Svidrigailov in respectful silence, looking wonderingly at his soaking clothes. The children all ran away at once in indescribable terror. Svidrigailov sat down at the table and asked Sonia to sit beside him. She timidly prepared to listen. "'I may be going to America, Sofia Semyonovna,' said Svidrigailov, "'and, as I am probably seeing you for the last time, I have come to make some arrangements. Well, did you see the lady today? I know what she said to you, you need not tell me." Sonia made a movement and blushed. Those people have their own way of doing things. As to your sisters and your brother, they are really provided for, and the money assigned to them I put into safekeeping and have received acknowledgments. You had better take charge of the receipts, in case anything happens. Here, take them. Well, now, that's settled. Here are three five-percent bonds to the value of three thousand roubles. Take those for yourself, entirely for yourself, and let that be strictly between ourselves, so that no one knows of it, whatever you hear. You will need the money, for to go on living in the old way, Sofia Semyonovna, is bad, and besides, there is no need for it now. I am so much indebted to you, 
and so are the children and my stepmother," said Sonia hurriedly. And if I said so little, please don't consider. That's enough, that's enough. But as for the money, Arkady Ivanovitch, I am very grateful to you, but I don't need it now. I can always earn my own living. Don't think me ungrateful. If you are so charitable, that money... It's for you, for you, Sofia Semyonovna, and please don't waste words over it. I haven't time for it. You will want it. Rodion Romanovich has two alternatives, a bullet in the brain or Siberia." Sonia looked wildly at him and started. "'Don't be uneasy. I know all about it from himself, and I am not a gossip. I won't tell anyone. It was good advice when you told him to give himself up and confess. It would be much better for him. Well, if it turns out to be Siberia, he will go and you will follow him. That's so, isn't it? And if so, you'll need money. You'll need it for him, do you understand? Giving it to you is the same as my giving it to him. Besides, you promised Amalia Ivanovna to pay what's owing. I heard you. How can you undertake such obligations so heedlessly, Sofia Semyonovna? It was Katerina Ivanovna's debt and not yours, so you ought not to have taken any notice of the German woman. You can't get through the world like that. If you are ever questioned about me, tomorrow or the day after you'll be asked, don't say anything about my coming to see you now, and don't show the money to anyone or say a word about it. Well now, good-bye." He got up. My greetings to Rodion Romanovich. By the way, you'd better put the money for the present in Mr. Razumian's keeping. You know Mr. Razumian? Of course you do. He's not a bad fellow. Take it to him tomorrow, or when the time comes. Until then, hide it carefully." Sonia too jumped up from her chair and looked in dismay at Svidrigailov. She longed to speak, to ask a question, but for the first moments she did not dare and did not know how to begin. "'How can you—how can you be going now, in such rain?' "'Why, be starting for America, and be stopped by rain? Ha, ha! Good-bye, Sofia Semyonovna, my dear. Live and live long. You will be of use to others. By the way, tell Mr. Razumian I send my greetings to him. Tell him Arkady Ivanovich Svidrigailov sends his greetings. Be sure to." He went out, leaving Sonia in a state of wondering anxiety and vague apprehension. It appeared afterwards that on the same evening, at twenty past eleven, he made another very eccentric and unexpected visit. The rain still persisted. Drenched to the skin, he walked into the little flat where the parents of his betrothed lived, in Third Street in Vasilyevsky Island. He knocked some time before he was admitted, and his visit at first caused great perturbation. But Svidrigailov could be very fascinating when he liked, so that the first, and indeed very intelligent surmise of the sensible parents, that Svidrigailov had probably had so much to drink that he did not know what he was doing, vanished immediately. The decrepit father was wheeled in to see Svidrigailov by the tender and sensible mother, who as usual began the conversation with various irrelevant questions. She never asked a direct question, but began by smiling and rubbing her hands, and then, if she were obliged to ascertain something, for instance, when Svidrigailov would like to have the wedding, she would begin by interested and almost eager questions about Paris and the court life there and only by degrees brought the conversation round to Third Street. On other occasions this had of course been very impressive, but this time Arkady Ivanovitch seemed particularly impatient, and insisted on seeing his betrothed at once, though he had been informed, to begin with, that she had already gone to bed. The girl of course appeared. Svidrigailov informed her at once that he was obliged by very important affairs to leave Petersburg for a time and therefore brought her fifteen thousand roubles and begged her accept them as a present from him, as he had long been intending to make her this trifling present before their wedding. The logical connection of the present with his immediate departure and the absolute necessity of visiting them for that purpose in pouring rain at midnight was not made clear. But it all went off very well. Even the inevitable ejaculations of wonder and regret the inevitable questions were extraordinarily few and restrained. 
On the other hand, the gratitude expressed was most glowing and was reinforced by tears from the most sensible of mothers. Svidrigailov got up, laughed, kissed his betrothed, patted her cheek, declared he would soon come back, and, noticing in her eyes, together with childish curiosity, a sort of earnest dumb inquiry, reflected and kissed her again, though he felt sincere anger inwardly at the thought that his present would be immediately locked up in the keeping of the most sensible of mothers. He went away, leaving them all in a state of extraordinary excitement, but the tender mamma, speaking quietly in a half-whisper, settled some of the most important of their doubts, concluding that Svidrigailov was a great man, a man of great affairs and connections and of great wealth, there was no knowing what he had in his mind. He would start off on a journey and give away money just as the fancy took him, so that there was nothing surprising about it. Of course it was strange that he was wet through, but Englishmen, for instance, are even more eccentric, and all these people of high society didn't think of what was said of them and didn't stand on ceremony. Possibly, indeed, he came like that on purpose to show that he was not afraid of anyone. Above all, not a word should be said about it, for God knows what might come of it, and the money must be locked up, and it was most fortunate that Fedosia, the cook, had not left the kitchen. And above all, not a word must be said to that old cat, Madame Reslich, and so on and so on. They sat up whispering till two o'clock but the girl went to bed much earlier, amazed and rather sorrowful. Svidrigailov, meanwhile, exactly at midnight, crossed the bridge on the way back to the mainland. The rain had ceased and there was a roaring wind. He began shivering, and for one moment he gazed at the black waters of the little Neva with a look of special interest, even inquiry. But he soon felt it very cold, standing by the water. He turned and went towards Y Prospect. He walked along that endless street for a long time, almost half an hour, more than once stumbling in the dark on the wooden pavement, but continually looking for something on the right side of the street. He had noticed passing through this street lately that there was a hotel somewhere towards the end, built of wood, but fairly large, and its name he remembered was something like Andrianople. He was not mistaken. The hotel was so conspicuous in that godforsaken place that he could not fail to see it even in the dark. It was a long, blackened wooden building, and in spite of the late hour there were lights on in the windows and signs of life within. He went in and asked a ragged fellow who met him in the corridor for a room. The latter, scanning Svidrigailov, pulled himself together and led him at once to a close and tiny room in the distance, at the end of the corridor, under the stairs. There was no other, all were occupied. The ragged fellow looked inquiringly. "'Is there tea?' asked Svidrigailov. "'Yes, sir.' "'What else is there?' "'Veal, vodka, savories.' "'Bring me tea and veal.' "'And you want nothing else?' he asked with apparent surprise. "'Nothing, nothing.' The ragged man went away, completely disillusioned. "'It must be a nice place,' thought Svidrigailov. How was it I didn't know it? I expect I look as if I came from a café chantant and have had some adventure on the way. It would be interesting to know who stayed here." He lighted the candle and looked at the room more carefully. It was a room so low-pitched that Svidrigailov could only just stand up in it. It had one window, the bed, which was very dirty, and the plain stained chair and table almost filled it up. The walls looked as though they were made of planks, covered with shabby paper, so torn and dusty that the pattern was indistinguishable, though the general color, yellow, could still be made out. One of the walls was cut short by the sloping ceiling, though the room was not an attic but just under the stairs. Svidrigailov set down the candle, sat down on the bed, and sank into thought. But a strange, persistent murmur, which sometimes rose to a shout in the next room, attracted his attention. The murmur had not ceased from the moment he entered the room. He listened. Someone was upbraiding and almost tearfully scolding, but he heard only one voice. Svidrigailov got up, shaded the light with his hand, and at once he saw light through a crack in the wall. He went up and peeped through. 
The room, which was somewhat larger than his, had two occupants. One of them, a very curly-headed man with a red inflamed face, was standing in the pose of an orator, without his coat, with his legs wide apart to preserve his balance, and smiting himself on the breast. He reproached the other with being a beggar, with having no standing whatever. He declared that he had taken the other out of the gutter, and he could turn him out when he liked, and that only the finger of Providence sees it all. The object of his reproaches was sitting in a chair, and had the air of a man who wants dreadfully to sneeze but can't. He sometimes turned sheepish and befogged eyes on the speaker, but obviously had not the slightest idea what he was talking about, and scarcely heard it. A candle was burning down on the table, there were wine-glasses, a nearly empty bottle of vodka, bread and cucumber, and glasses with the dregs of stale tea. After gazing attentively at this, Svidrigailov turned away indifferently and sat down on the bed. The ragged attendant, returning with the tea, could not resist asking him again whether he didn't want anything more, and again receiving a negative reply, finally withdrew. Svidrigailov made haste to drink a glass of tea to warm himself, but could not eat anything. He began to feel feverish. He took off his coat and, wrapping himself in the blanket, lay down on the bed. He was annoyed. "'It would have been better to be well for the occasion,' he thought with a smile. The room was close, the candle burnt dimly, the wind was roaring outside, he heard a mouse scratching in the corner, and the room smelt of mice and of leather. He lay in a sort of reverie. One thought followed another. He felt a longing to fix his imagination on something. It must be a garden under the window, he thought. There's a sound of trees. How I dislike the sound of trees on a stormy night, in the dark. They give one a horrid feeling. He remembered how he had disliked it when he passed Petrovsky Park just now. This reminded him of the bridge over the Little Neva, and he felt cold again as he had when standing there. I never have liked water, he thought, even in a landscape and he suddenly smiled again at a strange idea. Surely now all these questions of taste and comfort ought not to matter, but I've become more particular, like an animal that picks out a special place, for such an occasion. I ought to have gone into the Petrovsky Park. I suppose it seemed dark, cold, ha, ha, as though I were seeking pleasant sensations. By the way, why haven't I put out the candle? He blew it out. They've gone to bed next door, he thought, not seeing the light at the crack. Well, now, Marfa Petrovna, now is the time for you to turn up. It's dark, and the very time and place for you. But now you won't come. He suddenly recalled how, an hour before carrying out his design on Donia, he had recommended Raskolnikov to trust her to Razumian's keeping. I suppose I really did say it, as Raskolnikov guessed to tease myself. But what a rogue that Raskolnikov is! He's gone through a good deal. He may be a successful rogue in time, when he's got over his nonsense, but now he's too eager for life. These young men are contemptible on that point. But hang the fellow! Let him please himself, it's nothing to do with me." He could not get to sleep. By degrees Donia's image rose before him and a shudder ran over him. No, I must give up all that now, he thought, rousing himself. I must think of something else. It's queer and funny. I never had a great hatred for anyone. I never particularly desired to avenge myself even, and that's a bad sign, a bad sign, a bad sign. I never liked quarreling either, and never lost my temper. That's a bad sign, too and the promises I made her just now, too. Damnation! But who knows? Perhaps she would have made a new man of me somehow." He ground his teeth and sank into silence again. Again Donia's image rose before him, just as she was when, after shooting the first time, she had lowered the revolver in terror and gazed blankly at him, so that he might have seized her twice over and she would not have lifted a hand to defend herself if he had not reminded her. 
he recalled how at that instant he felt almost sorry for her, how he had felt a pang at his heart. Ay, damnation, these thoughts again! I must put it away!" He was dozing off. The feverish shiver had ceased, when suddenly something seemed to run over his arm and leg under the bedclothes. He started. Ugh! Hang it! I believe it's a mouse, he thought. That's the veal I left on the table. He felt fearfully disinclined to pull off the blanket, get up, get cold, but all at once something unpleasant ran over his leg again. He pulled off the blanket and lighted the candle. Shaking with feverish chill, he bent down to examine the bed. There was nothing. He shook the blanket, and suddenly a mouse jumped out on the sheet. He tried to catch it, but the mouse ran to and fro in zigzags without leaving the bed, slipped between his fingers, ran over his hand, and suddenly darted under the pillow. He threw down the pillow, but in one instant felt something leap on his chest and dart over his body and down his back under his shirt. He trembled nervously and woke up. The room was dark. He was lying on the bed and wrapped up in the blanket as before. The wind was howling under the window. How disgusting! he thought with annoyance. He got up and sat on the edge of the bedstead with his back to the window. It's better not to sleep at all, he decided. There was a cold, damp draft from the window, however. Without getting up, he drew the blanket over him and wrapped himself in it. He was not thinking of anything and did not want to think. But one image rose after another. Incoherent scraps of thought without beginning or end passed through his mind. He sank into drowsiness. Perhaps the cold, or the dampness, or the dark, or the wind that howled under the window and tossed the trees roused a sort of persistent craving for the fantastic. He kept dwelling on images of flowers. He fancied a charming flower-garden, a bright, warm, almost hot day, a holiday, Trinity Day. A fine, sumptuous country cottage in the English taste overgrown with fragrant flowers, with flower-beds going round the house. The porch, wreathed in climbers, was surrounded with beds of roses. A light, cool staircase, carpeted with rich rugs, was decorated with rare plants in china pots. He noticed particularly in the windows nosegays of tender, white, heavily fragrant narcissus bending over their bright, green, thick, long stalks. He was reluctant to move away from them, but he went up the stairs and came into a large, high drawing-room and again everywhere, at the windows, the doors on the balcony, and on the balcony itself, were flowers. The floors were strewn with freshly cut fragrant hay. The windows were open. A fresh, cool, light air came into the room. The birds were chirruping under the window, and in the middle of the room, on a table covered with a white satin shroud, stood a coffin. The coffin was covered with white silk and edged with a thick white frill. Wreaths of flowers surrounded it on all sides. Among the flowers lay a girl in a white muslin dress, with her arms crossed and pressed on her bosom, as though carved out of marble. But her loose fair hair was wet. There was a wreath of roses on her head. The stern and already rigid profile of her face looked as though chiseled of marble too, and the smile on her pale lips was full of an immense unchildish misery and sorrowful appeal. Zvidrigailov knew that girl. There was no holy image, no burning candle beside the coffin, no sound of prayers. The girl had drowned herself. She was only fourteen, but her heart was broken. And she had destroyed herself, crushed by an insult that had appalled and amazed that childish soul, had smirched that angel purity with unmerited disgrace, and torn from her a last scream of despair, unheeded and brutally disregarded, on a dark night in the cold and wet while the wind howled. Svidrigailov came to himself, got up from the bed and went to the window. He felt for the latch and opened it. The wind lashed furiously into the little room and stung his face and chest, only covered with his shirt, as though with frost. Under the window there must have been something like a garden, and apparently a pleasure garden. There, too, probably, there were tea-tables and singing in the daytime. 
Now drops of rain flew in at the window from the trees and bushes. It was dark as in a cellar, so that he could only just make out the dark blurs of objects. Svidrigailov, bending down with elbows on the window-sill, gazed for five minutes into the darkness. The boom of a cannon, followed by a second one, resounded in the darkness of the night. Ah, the signal! The river is overflowing, he thought. By morning it will be swirling down the street in the lower parts, flooding the basements and cellars. The cellar rats will swim out, and men will curse in the rain and wind as they drag their rubbish to the upper stories. What time is it now? And he had hardly thought it when, somewhere near, a clock on the wall, ticking away hurriedly, struck three. Aha! It will be light in an hour. Why wait? I'll go out at once straight to the park. I'll choose a great bush there drenched with rain, so that as soon as one's shoulder touches it, millions of drops drip on one's head." He moved away from the window, shut it, lighted the candle, put on his waistcoat, his overcoat and his hat and went out, carrying the candle, into the passage to look for the ragged attendant, who would be asleep somewhere in the midst of candle-ends and all sorts of rubbish, to pay him for the room and leave the hotel. It's the best minute. I couldn't choose a better." He walked for some time through a long, narrow corridor without finding anyone, and was just going to call out, when suddenly in a dark corner between an old cupboard and the door he caught sight of a strange object which seemed to be alive. He bent down with the candle and saw a little girl, not more than five years old, shivering and crying, with her clothes as wet as a soaking-house flannel. She did not seem afraid of Svidrigailov but looked at him with blank amazement out of her big black eyes. Now and then she sobbed as children do when they have been crying a long time, but are beginning to be comforted. The child's face was pale and tired. She was numb with cold. How can she have come here? She must have hidden here and not slept all night. He began questioning her. The child suddenly became animated clattered away in her baby language, something about Mammy and that Mammy would beat her, and about some cup she had woken. The child chattered on without stopping. He could only guess from what she said that she was a neglected child, whose mother, probably a drunken cook, in the service of the hotel, whipped and frightened her, that the child had broken a cup of her mother's and was so frightened that she had run away the evening before, had hidden for a long while somewhere outside in the rain, at last had made her way in here, hidden behind the cupboard, and spent the night there, crying and trembling from the damp, the darkness and the fear that she would be badly beaten for it. He took her in his arms, went back to his room, sat her on the bed, and began undressing her. The torn shoes which she had on her stockingless feet were as wet as if she had been standing in a puddle all night. When he had undressed her, he put her on the bed covered her up and wrapped her in the blanket from her head downwards. She fell asleep at once. Then he sank into dreary musing again. What folly to trouble myself, he decided suddenly with an oppressive feeling of annoyance. What idiocy! In vexation he took up the candle to go and look for the ragged attendant again and make haste to go away. Damn the child, he thought as he opened the door but he turned again to see whether the child was asleep. He raised the blanket carefully. The child was sleeping soundly, she had got warm under the blanket, and her pale cheeks were flushed. But strange to say, that flush seemed brighter and coarser than the rosy cheeks of childhood. Flush of fever, thought Svidrigailov. It was like the flush from drinking, as though she had been given a full glass to drink. Her crimson lips were hot and glowing. But what was this? He suddenly fancied that her long black eyelashes were quivering, as though the lids were opening, and a sly, crafty eye peeped out with an unchildlike wink, as though the little girl were not asleep but pretending. Yes, it was so. Her lips parted in a smile. The corners of her mouth quivered, as though she were trying to control them. But now she quite gave up all effort. Now it was a grin, a broad grin. There was something shameless, provocative in that quite unchildish face. It was depravity. 
It was the face of a harlot, the shameless face of a French harlot. Now both eyes opened wide. They turned a glowing, shameless glance upon him. They laughed, invited him. There was something infinitely hideous and shocking in that laugh, in those eyes, in such nastiness in the face of a child. "'What? At five years old?' Svidrigailov muttered in genuine horror. "'What does it mean?' And now she turned to him, her little face all aglow, holding out her arms. "'A cursed child!' Svidrigailov cried, raising his hand to strike her. But at that moment he woke up. He was in the same bed, still wrapped in the blanket. The candle had not been lighted, and daylight was streaming in at the windows. "'I've had nightmare all night!' He got up angrily, feeling utterly shattered. His bones ached. There was a thick mist outside, and he could see nothing. It was nearly five. He had overslept himself. He got up, put on his still damp jacket and overcoat. Feeling the revolver in his pocket, he took it out and then he sat down, took a notebook out of his pocket and in the most conspicuous place on the title page wrote a few lines in large letters. Reading them over, he sank into thought with his elbows on the table. The revolver and the notebook lay beside him. Some flies woke up and settled on the untouched veal, which was still on the table. He stared at them and at last with his free right hand began trying to catch one. He tried till he was tired, but could not catch it. At last, realizing that he was engaged in this interesting pursuit, he started, got up, and walked resolutely out of the room. A minute later he was in the street. A thick milky mist hung over the town. Svidrigailov walked along the slippery, dirty wooden pavement towards the Little Neva. He was picturing the waters of the Little Neva swollen in the night, Petrovsky Island the wet paths, the wet grass, the wet trees and bushes, and at last the bush. He began ill-humouredly staring at the houses, trying to think of something else. There was not a cabman or a passer-by in the street. The bright yellow, wooden little houses looked dirty and dejected with their closed shutters. The cold and damp penetrated his whole body, and he began to shiver. From time to time he came across shop signs and read each carefully. At last he reached the end of the wooden pavement and came to a big stone house. A dirty, shivering dog crossed his path with its tail between its legs. A man in a greatcoat lay face downwards, dead drunk across the pavement. He looked at him and went on. A high tower stood up on the left. Bah! he shouted. Here is a place. Why should it be Petrovsky? It will be in the presence of an official witness, anyway." He almost smiled at this new thought, and turned into the street where there was the big house with the tower. At the great closed gates of the house a little man stood with his shoulder leaning against them, wrapped in a grey soldier's coat, with a copper Achilles helmet on his head. He cast a drowsy and indifferent glance at Svidrigailov. His face wore that perpetual look of peevish dejection, which is so sourly printed on all the faces of Jewish race without exception. They both, Svidrigailov and Achilles, stared at each other for a few minutes without speaking. At last it struck Achilles as irregular for a man not drunk to be standing three steps from him, staring and not saying a word. "'What do you want here?' he said, without moving or changing his position. "'Nothing, brother. Good morning,' answered Svidrigailov. "'This isn't the place.' "'I am going to foreign parts, brother.' "'To foreign parts?' "'To America.' "'America.' Svidrigailov took out the revolver and cocked it. Achilles raised his eyebrows. "'I say, this is not the place for such jokes.' "'Why shouldn't it be the place?' "'Because it isn't.' Well, brother, I don't mind that. It's a good place. When you are asked, you just say he was going, he said, to America. He put the revolver to his right temple. You can't do it here. It's not the place, cried Achilles, rousing himself, his eyes growing bigger and bigger. Zvidrigailov pulled the trigger. End of Part 6, Chapter 6
Part Six, Chapter Seven of Crime and Punishment by Fyodor Dostoevsky, translated by Constance Garnett, 1861 to 1946. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part Six, Chapter Seven. The same day, about seven o'clock in the evening, Raskolnikov was on his way to his mother's and sister's lodging, the lodging at Bakaliev's house, which Razumihin had found for them. The stairs went up from the street. Raskolnikov walked with lagging steps, as though still hesitating whether to go or not. But nothing would have turned him back. His decision was taken. Besides, it doesn't matter. They still know nothing, he thought. And they are used to thinking of me as eccentric. He was appallingly dressed. His clothes torn and dirty, soaked with the night's rain. His face was almost distorted from fatigue, exposure, the inward conflict that had lasted for twenty-four hours. He had spent all the previous night alone, God knows where. But anyway, he had reached a decision. He knocked at the door which was opened by his mother. Donia was not at home. Even the servant happened to be out. At first Polcheria Alexandrovna was speechless with joy and surprise. Then she took him by the hand and drew him into the room. "'Here you are,' she began, faltering with joy. "'Don't be angry with me, Rodya, for welcoming you so foolishly with tears. I am laughing, not crying. Did you think I was crying? No, I am delighted, but I've got into such a stupid habit of shedding tears. I've been like that ever since your father's death. I cry for anything.' Sit down, dear boy, you must be tired. I see you are. Oh, how muddy you are!" "'I was in the rain yesterday, mother,' Raskolnikov began. "'No, no,' Polcheria Alexandrovna hurriedly interrupted. "'You thought I was going to cross-question you in the womanish way I used to. Don't be anxious. I understand. I understand it all. Now I've learned the ways here, and truly I see for myself that they are better. I've made up my mind once for all. How could I understand your plans and expect you to give an account of them? God knows what concerns and plans you may have, or what ideas you are hatching, so it's not for me to keep nudging your elbow, asking you what you are thinking about. But, my goodness, why am I running to and fro as though I were crazy? I am reading your article in the magazine for the third time, Rodya. Dmitri Prokovitch brought it to me. Directly I saw it, I cried out to myself. There, foolish one, I thought, that's what he is busy about, that's the solution of the mystery. Learned people are always like that. He may have some new ideas in his head just now. He is thinking them over, and I worry him and upset him. I read it, my dear, and of course there was a great deal I did not understand, but that's only natural. How should I? Show me, mother. Raskolnikov took the magazine and glanced at his article. Incongruous as it was with his mood and his circumstances, he felt that strange and bittersweet sensation that every author experiences the first time he sees himself in print. Besides, he was only twenty-three. It lasted only a moment. After reading a few lines he frowned and his heart throbbed with anguish. He recalled all the inward conflict of the preceding months. He flung the article on the table with disgust and anger. But, however foolish I may be, Rodya, I can see for myself that you will very soon be one of the leading, if not the leading man, in the world of Russian thought. And they dared to think you were mad. You don't know, but they really thought that. Ah, the despicable creatures! How could they understand genius? And Donia, Donia was all but believing it. What do you say to that? Your father sent twice to magazines, the first time poems, I've got the manuscript and will show you, and the second time a whole novel. I begged him to let me copy it out, and how we prayed that they should be taken. They weren't. I was breaking my heart, Rodya, six or seven days ago, over your food and your clothes and the way you were living. But now I see again how foolish I was for you can attain any position you like by your intellect and talent. No doubt you don't care about that for the present, and you are occupied with much more important matters." Donia's not at home, mother?' "'No, Rodya. I often don't see her. 
She leaves me alone. Dmitri Prokovitch comes to see me. It's so good of him, and he always talks about you. He loves you and respects you, my dear. I don't say that Donya is very wanting in consideration. I am not complaining. She has her ways and I have mine. She seems to have got some secrets of late, and I never have any secrets from you two. Of course, I am sure that Donya has far too much sense, and besides, she loves you and me. But I don't know what it will all lead to. You've made me so happy by coming now, Rodya, but she has missed you by going out. When she comes in, I'll tell her. Your brother came in while you were out. Where have you been all this time? You mustn't spoil me, Rodya, you know. Come when you can, but if you can't, it doesn't matter. I can wait. I shall know, anyway, that you are fond of me. That will be enough for me. I shall read what you write. I shall hear about you from everyone, and sometimes you'll come yourself to see me. What could be better? Here you've come now to comfort your mother, I see that." Here Polcheria Alexandrovna began to cry. "'Here I am again. Don't mind my foolishness. My goodness, why am I sitting here?' she cried, jumping up. "'There is coffee, and I don't offer you any. Ah, that's the selfishness of old age. I'll get it at once. Mother, don't trouble. I am going at once. I haven't come for that. Please listen to me.' Polcheria Alexandrovna went up to him timidly. "'Mother, whatever happens, whatever you hear about me, whatever you are told about me, you will always love me as you do now?' he asked suddenly from the fullness of his heart, as though not thinking of his words and not weighing them. "'Rodya, Rodya, what is the matter? How can you ask me such a question? Why, who will tell me anything about you?' Besides, I shouldn't believe anyone, I should refuse to listen. I've come to assure you that I've always loved you, and am glad that we are alone, even glad Donya is out," he went on with the same impulse. I have come to tell you that, though you will be unhappy, you must believe that your son loves you now more than himself, and that all you thought about me, that I was cruel and didn't care about you, was all a mistake. I shall never cease to love you. Well, that's enough. I thought I must do this and begin with this." Pulcheria Alexandrovna embraced him in silence, pressing him to her bosom and weeping gently. "'I don't know what is wrong with you, Rodya,' she said at last. "'I've been thinking all this time that we were simply boring you, and now I see that there is a great sorrow in store for you, and that's why you are miserable. I've foreseen it a long time, Rodya. Forgive me for speaking about it. I keep thinking about it and lie awake at nights. Your sister lay talking in her sleep all last night, talking of nothing but you. I caught something, but I couldn't make it out. I felt all the morning as though I were going to be hanged, waiting for something, expecting something, and now it has come. Rodya, Rodya, where are you going? You are going away somewhere? Yes. That's what I thought. I can come with you, you know, if you need me, and Donya too. She loves you, she loves you dearly, and Sofia Semyonovna may come with us if you like. You see, I am glad to look upon her as a daughter even. Dmitri Prokovitch will help us to go together. But where are you going? Goodbye, mother. What? Today? she cried, as though losing him forever. I can't stay. I must go now. And can't I come with you? No. But kneel down and pray to God for me. Your prayer perhaps will reach him. Let me bless you and sign you with the cross. That's right, that's right. Oh, God, what are we doing? Yes, he was glad. He was very glad that there was no one there, that he was alone with his mother. For the first time, after all those awful months, his heart was softened. He fell down before her, he kissed her feet, and both wept, embracing. And she was not surprised and did not question him this time. For some days she had realized that something awful was happening to her son, and that now some terrible minute had come for him. "'Rodya, my darling, my firstborn,' she said, sobbing, "'now you are just as when you were little.' 
you would run like this to me and hug me and kiss me. When your father was living and we were poor, you comforted us simply by being with us, and when I buried your father, how often we wept together at his grave and embraced, as now. And if I've been crying lately, it's that my mother's heart had a foreboding of trouble. The first time I saw you, that evening, you remember, as soon as we arrived here, I guessed simply from your eyes. My heart sank at once, and today, when I opened the door and looked at you, I thought the fatal hour had come. Rodya, Rodya, you are not going away today? No. You'll come again? Yes, I'll come. Rodya, don't be angry. I don't dare to question you. I know I mustn't. Only say two words to me. Is it far where you are going? Very far. What is awaiting you there? Some post or career for you? What God sends. Only pray for me. Raskolnikov went to the door, but she clutched him and gazed despairingly into his eyes. Her face worked with terror. Enough, mother, said Raskolnikov, deeply regretting that he had come. Not forever. Is it not forever? You'll come, you'll come tomorrow? I will, I will. Good-bye. He tore himself away at last. It was a warm, fresh, bright evening. It had cleared up in the morning. Raskolnikov went to his lodgings. He made haste. He wanted to finish all before sunset. He did not want to meet anyone till then. Going up the stairs, he noticed that Nastasha rushed from the samovar to watch him intently. "'Can anyone have come to see me?' he wondered. He had a disgusted vision of Porfiry. But opening his door, he saw Donya. She was sitting alone, plunged in deep thought, and looked as though she had been waiting a long time. He stopped short in the doorway. She rose from the sofa in dismay and stood up facing him. Her eyes, fixed upon him, betrayed horror and infinite grief. And from those eyes alone he saw at once that she knew. "'Am I to come in or go away?' he asked uncertainly. "'I've been all day with Sofia Semyonovna. We were both waiting for you. We thought that you would be sure to come there.' Raskolnikov went into the room and sank exhausted on a chair. I feel weak, Donya. I am very tired, and I should have liked at this moment to be able to control myself." He glanced at her mistrustfully. "'Where were you all night?' "'I don't remember clearly. You see, sister, I wanted to make up my mind once for all, and several times I walked by the Neva. I remember that I wanted to end it all there, but I couldn't make up my mind he whispered, looking at her mistrustfully again. "'Thank God! That was just what we were afraid of, Sofia Semyonovna and I. Then you still have faith in life? Thank God! Thank God!' Raskolnikov smiled bitterly. "'I haven't faith, but I have just been weeping in mother's arms. I haven't faith, but I have just asked her to pray for me. I don't know how it is, Donya. I don't understand it. "'Have you been at Mother's? Have you told her?' cried Donya, horror-stricken. "'Surely you haven't done that!' "'No, I didn't tell her. In words. But she understood a great deal. She heard you talking in your sleep. I am sure she half understands it already. Perhaps I did wrong in going to see her. I don't know why I did go. I am a contemptible person, Donya a contemptible person, but ready to face suffering. You are, aren't you?" Yes, I am going. At once. Yes, to escape the disgrace, I thought of drowning myself, Donya. But as I looked into the water, I thought that if I had considered myself strong till now, I'd better not be afraid of disgrace," he said, hurrying on. It's pride, Donya. Pride, Rodya. There was a gleam of fire in his lusterless eyes. He seemed to be glad to think that he was still proud. "'You don't think, sister, that I was simply afraid of the water?' he asked, looking into her face with a sinister smile. 
Oh, Rodya, hush! cried Donya bitterly. Silence lasted for two minutes. He sat with his eyes fixed on the floor. Donya stood at the other end of the table and looked at him with anguish. Suddenly he got up. It's late. It's time to go. I am going at once to give myself up. But I don't know why I am going to give myself up. Big tears fell from her cheeks. You are crying, sister. But can you hold out your hand to me? You doubted it? She threw her arms round him. Aren't you half expiating your crime by facing the suffering? she cried, holding him close and kissing him. Crime? What crime? he cried in sudden fury. That I killed a vile, noxious insect? An old pawnbroker woman, of use to no one? Killing her was an atonement for forty sins. She was sucking the life out of poor people. Was that a crime? I am not thinking of it, and I am not thinking of expiating it. And why are you all rubbing it in on all sides? A crime! A crime! Only now I see clear the imbecility of my cowardice, now that I have decided to face this superfluous disgrace. It's simply because I am contemptible and have nothing in me that I have decided to, perhaps, too, for my advantage, as that, Porphyry, suggested. "'Brother, brother, what are you saying? Why, you have shed blood?' cried Donia in despair. "'Which all men shed,' he put in almost frantically, "'which flows and has always flowed in streams, which is spilt like champagne.' and for which men are crowned in the capital, and are called afterwards benefactors of mankind. Look into it more carefully and understand it. I, too, wanted to do good to men, and would have done hundreds, thousands of good deeds to make up for that one piece of stupidity. Not stupidity, even, simply clumsiness, for the idea was by no means stupid, as it seems now that it has failed. Everything seems stupid when it fails. By that stupidity I only wanted to put myself into an independent position, to take the first step, to obtain means, and then everything would have been smoothed over by benefits immeasurable in comparison. But I, I couldn't carry out even the first step, because I am contemptible, that's what's the matter. And yet I won't look at it as you do. If I had succeeded, I should have been crowned with glory but now I'm trapped. But that's not so, not so. Brother, what are you saying? Ah, it's not picturesque, not aesthetically attractive. I fail to understand why bombarding people by regular siege is more honorable. The fear of appearances is the first symptom of impotence. I've never, never recognized this more clearly than now, and I am further than ever from seeing that what I did was a crime. I've never, never been stronger and more convinced than now." The color had rushed into his pale, exhausted face, but as he uttered this last explanation he happened to meet Donia's eyes, and he saw such anguish in them that he could not help being checked. He felt that he had, anyway, made these two poor women miserable, that he was, anyway, the cause. Donya, darling, if I am guilty, forgive me, though I cannot be forgiven if I am guilty. Good-bye. We won't dispute. It's time, high time to go. Don't follow me, I beseech you. I have somewhere else to go. But you go at once and sit with mother. I entreat you to. It's my last request of you. Don't leave her at all. I left her in a state of anxiety, that she is not fit to bear. She will die or go out of her mind. Be with her. Razumian will be with you. I've been talking to him. Don't cry about me. I'll try to be honest and manly all my life, even if I am a murderer. Perhaps I shall some day make a name. I won't disgrace you, you will see. I'll still show— Now good-bye for the present," he concluded hurriedly noticing again a strange expression in Donya's eyes at his last words and promises. "'Why are you crying? Don't cry! Don't cry! We are not parting forever! Ah, yes, wait a minute, I'd forgotten.' He went to the table, took up a thick dusty book, 
opened it and took from between the pages a little watercolor portrait on ivory. It was the portrait of his landlady's daughter who had died of fever, that strange girl who had wanted to be a nun. For a minute he gazed at the delicate expressive face of his betrothed, kissed the portrait and gave it to Donia. "'I used to talk a great deal about it to her, only to her,' he said thoughtfully. To her heart I confided much of what has since been so hideously realized. Don't be uneasy," he returned to Donia. She was as much opposed to it as you, and I am glad that she is gone. The great point is that everything now is going to be different, is going to be broken in two, he cried, suddenly returning to his dejection. Everything, everything, and am I prepared for it? Do I want it myself? They say it is necessary for me to suffer. What's the object of these senseless sufferings? Shall I know any better what they are for when I am crushed by hardships and idiocy and weak as an old man after twenty years' penal servitude? And what shall I have to live for then? Why am I consenting to that life now? Oh, I knew I was contemptible when I stood looking at the Neva at daybreak today. At last they both went out. It was hard for Donia, but she loved him. She walked away, but after going fifty paces she turned round to look at him again. He was still in sight. At the corner he too turned and for the last time their eyes met, but noticing that she was looking at him he motioned her away with impatience and even vexation and turned the corner abruptly. "'I am wicked, I see that,' he thought to himself, feeling ashamed a moment later of his angry gesture to Donia. But why are they so fond of me if I don't deserve it? Oh, if only I were alone, and no one loved me, and I too had never loved anyone! Nothing of all this would have happened! But I wonder shall I in those fifteen or twenty years grow so meek that I shall humble myself before people and whimper at every word that I am a criminal? Yes, that's it, that's it, that's what they are sending me there for, that's what they want. Look at them running to and fro about the streets, every one of them a scoundrel and a criminal at heart, and worse still, an idiot. But try to get me off, and they be wild with righteous indignation. Oh, how I hate them all!" He fell to musing by what process it would come to pass, that he could be humble before all of them, indiscriminately, humbled by conviction. And yet, why not? It must be so. Would not twenty years of continual bondage crush him utterly? Water wears out a stone. And why, why should he live after that? Why should he go now when he knew that it would be so? It was the hundredth time, perhaps, that he had asked himself that question since the previous evening. But still he went. End of Part 6 Chapter 7「Part Six, Chapter Eight of Crime and Punishment by Fyodor Dostoevsky, translated by Constance Garnett, 1861 to 1946. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part Six, Chapter Eight When he went into Sonia's room, it was already getting dark. All day Sonia had been waiting for him in terrible anxiety. Donia had been waiting with her. She had come to her that morning, remembering Svidrigailov's words that Sonia knew. We will not describe the conversation and tears of the two girls, and how friendly they became. Donia gained one comfort at least from that interview, that her brother would not be alone. He had gone to her, Sonia, first with his confession. He had gone to her for human fellowship when he needed it. She would go with him wherever fate might send him. Donia did not ask, but she knew it was so. She looked at Sonia almost with reverence, and at first almost embarrassed her by it. Sonia was almost on the point of tears. She felt herself, on the contrary, hardly worthy to look at Donia. Donia's gracious image, when she had bowed to her so attentively and respectfully at their first meeting in Raskolnikov's room, had remained in her mind as one of the fairest visions of her life. Donia at last became impatient, 
and, leaving Sonia, went to her brother's room to await him there. She kept thinking that he would come there first. When she had gone, Sonia began to be tortured by the dread of his committing suicide, and Donia too feared it. But they had spent the day trying to persuade each other that that could not be, and both were less anxious while they were together. As soon as they parted, each thought of nothing else. Sonia remembered how Svidrigailov had said to her the day before that Raskolnikov had two alternatives, Siberia or... Besides, she knew his vanity, his pride, and his lack of faith. "'Is it possible that he has nothing but cowardice and fear of death to make him live?' she thought at last in despair. Meanwhile the sun was setting. Sonia was standing in dejection, looking intently out of the window, but from it she could see nothing but the unwhitewashed blank wall of the next house. At last, when she began to feel sure of his death, he walked into the room. She gave a cry of joy, but looking carefully into his face she turned pale. "'Yes,' said Raskolnikov, smiling. "'I have come for your cross, Sonia. It was you told me to go to the crossroads. Why is it you are frightened now it's come to that?' Sonia gazed at him astonished. His tone seemed strange to her. A cold shiver ran over her, but in a moment she guessed that the tone and the words were a mask. He spoke to her looking away, as though to avoid meeting her eyes. "'You see, Sonia, I've decided that it would be better so. There is one fact, but it's a long story and there's no need to discuss it. But do you know what angers me? It annoys me that all these stupid, brutish faces will be gaping at me directly pestering me with their stupid questions, which I shall have to answer. They'll point their fingers at me. Foo! You know, I am not going to Porfiry. I am sick of him. I'd rather go to my friend, the explosive lieutenant. How I shall surprise him! What a sensation I shall make! But I must be cooler. I've become too irritable of late. You know, I was nearly shaking my fist at my sister just now because she turned to take a last look at me. It's a brutal state to be in. Ah, what am I coming to? Well, where are the crosses?" He seemed hardly to know what he was doing. He could not stay still or concentrate his attention on anything. His ideas seemed to gallop after one another, he talked incoherently, his hands trembled slightly. Without a word Sonya took out of the drawer two crosses one of cypress wood and one of copper. She made the sign of the cross over herself and over him, and put the wooden cross on his neck. "'It's the symbol of my taking up the cross,' he laughed. "'As though I had not suffered much till now. The wooden cross, that is the peasant one. The copper one, that is Lizaveta's. You will wear yourself. Show me.' So she had it on, at that moment? I remember two things like these too, a silver one and a little icon. I threw them back on the old woman's neck. Those would be appropriate now, really, those are what I ought to put on now. But I am talking nonsense and forgetting what matters. I am somehow forgetful. You see, I have come to warn you, Sonia, so that you might know. That's all, that's all I came for. But I thought I had more to say. You wanted me to go yourself. Well, now I am going to prison, and you'll have your wish. Well, what are you crying for? You too? Don't. Leave off. Oh, how I hate it all!" But his feeling was stirred, his heart ached as he looked at her. Why is she grieving too? he thought to himself. What am I to her? Why does she weep? Why is she looking after me? like my mother or Donia. She'll be my nurse." "'Cross yourself. Say at least one prayer,' Sonia begged in a timid, broken voice. "'Oh, certainly, as much as you like. And sincerely, Sonia, sincerely.' But he wanted to say something quite different. He crossed himself several times. Sonia took up her shawl and put it over her head. It was the green, dropped-a-dom shawl of which Marmeladov had spoken, the family shawl. 
Raskolnikov thought of that looking at it, but he did not ask. He began to feel himself that he was certainly forgetting things and was disgustingly agitated. He was frightened at this. He was suddenly struck, too, by the thought that Sonia meant to go with him. "'What are you doing? Where are you going? Stay here, stay! I'll go alone!' he cried in cowardly vexation, and almost resentful, he moved towards the door. "'What's the use of going in procession?' he muttered going out. Sonia remained standing in the middle of the room. He had not even said good-bye to her. He had forgotten her. A poignant and rebellious doubt surged in his heart. "'Was it right? Was it right, all this?' he thought again as he went down the stairs. Couldn't he stop and retract it all and not go? But still he went. He felt suddenly once for all that he mustn't ask himself questions. As he turned into the street, he remembered that he had not said good-bye to Sonia, that he had left her in the middle of the room in her green shawl, not daring to stir after he had shouted at her, and he stopped short for a moment. At the same instant another thought dawned upon him as though it had been lying in wait to strike him then. Why, with what object did I go to her just now? I told her, on business. On what business? I had no sort of business. To tell her I was going. But where was the need? Do I love her? No, no, I drove her away just now like a dog. Did I want her crosses? Oh, how low I've sunk! No. I wanted her tears. I wanted to see her terror, to see how her heart ached. I had to have something to cling to, something to delay me, some friendly face to see. And I dared to believe in myself, to dream of what I would do. I am a beggarly contemptible wretch, contemptible." He walked along the canal bank, and he had not much further to go. But on reaching the bridge, he stopped and, turning out of his way along it, went to the haymarket. He looked eagerly to right and left, gazed intently at every object, and could not fix his attention on anything. Everything slipped away. In another week, another month, I shall be driven in a prison van over this bridge. How shall I look at the canal then? I should like to remember this, slipped into his mind. Look at that sign. How shall I read those letters, then? It's written here, Campany. That's a thing to remember, that letter A, and to look at it again in a month. How shall I look at it then? What shall I be feeling and thinking then? How trivial it all must be, what I am fretting about now. Of course it must all be interesting, in its way. Ha, ha, ha! What am I thinking about? I am becoming a baby. I am showing off to myself. Why am I ashamed? Foo! How people shove! That fat man, a German he must be, who pushed against me, does he know whom he pushed? There's a peasant woman with a baby, begging. It's curious that she thinks me happier than she is. I might give her something for the incongruity of it. Here's a five kopeck piece left in my pocket. Where did I get it? Here! Here, take it, my good woman." "'God bless you,' the beggar chanted in a lachrymose voice. He went into the haymarket. It was distasteful, very distasteful to be in a crowd, but he walked just where he saw most people. He would have given anything in the world to be alone, but he knew himself that he would not have remained alone for a moment. There was a man drunk and disorderly in the crowd he kept trying to dance and falling down. There was a ring round him. Raskolnikov squeezed his way through the crowd, stared for some minutes at the drunken man, and suddenly gave a short, jerky laugh. A minute later he had forgotten him and did not see him, though he still stared. He moved away at last, not remembering where he was. But when he got into the middle of the square an emotion suddenly came over him, overwhelming him body and mind. He suddenly recalled Sonia's words. "'Go to the crossroads, bow down to the people, kiss the earth, for you have sinned against it too, and say aloud to the whole world, I am a murderer!' 
he trembled, remembering that. And the hopeless misery and anxiety of all that time, especially of the last hours, had weighed so heavily upon him that he positively clutched at the chance of this new unmixed, complete sensation. It came over him like a fit, it was like a single spark kindled in his soul and spreading fire through him. Everything in him softened at once, and the tears started into his eyes. He fell to the earth on the spot. He knelt down in the middle of the square, bowed down to the earth, and kissed that filthy earth with bliss and rapture. He got up, bowed down a second time. "'He's boozed!' a youth near him observed. There was a roar of laughter. "'He's going to Jerusalem, brothers, and saying good-bye to his children and his country. He's bowing down to all the world and kissing the great city of St. Petersburg and its pavement,' added a workman who was a little drunk. "'Quite a young man, too,' observed a third. "'And a gentleman,' someone observed soberly. "'There's no knowing who's a gentleman and who isn't nowadays.' These exclamations and remarks checked Raskolnikov, and the words, I am a murderer, which were perhaps on the point of dropping from his lips, died away. He bore these remarks quietly, however, and without looking round he turned down a street leading to the police office. He had a glimpse of something on the way which did not surprise him. He had felt that it must be so. The second time he bowed down in the haymarket, he saw, standing fifty paces from him on the left, Sonia. She was hiding from him behind one of the wooden shanties in the marketplace. She had followed him then on his painful way. Raskolnikov at that moment felt and knew once for all that Sonia was with him forever, and would follow him to the ends of the earth, wherever fate might take him. It wrung his heart, but he was just reaching the fatal place. He went into the yard fairly resolutely. He had to mount to the third story. I shall be some time going up, he thought. He felt as though the fateful moment was still far off, as though he had plenty of time left for consideration. Again the same rubbish, the same eggshells lying about on the spiral stairs, again the open doors of the flats, again the same kitchens and the same fumes and stench coming from them. Raskolnikov had not been there since that day. His legs were numb and gave way under him, but still they moved forward. He stopped for a moment to take breath, to collect himself, so as to enter like a man. But why? What for? he wondered, reflecting. If I must drink the cup, what difference does it make? The more revolting the better. He imagined for an instant the figure of the explosive lieutenant, Ilya Petrovitch. Was he actually going to him? Couldn't he go to someone else, to Nikodim Fomitch? Couldn't he turn back and go straight to Nikodim Fomitch's lodgings? At least then it would be done privately. No, no, to the explosive lieutenant. If he must drink it, drink it off at once. Turning cold and hardly conscious, he opened the door of the office. There were very few people in it this time, only a house porter and a peasant. The doorkeeper did not even peep out from behind his screen. Raskolnikov walked into the next room. Perhaps I still need not speak, passed through his mind. Some sort of clerk not wearing a uniform was settling himself at a bureau to write. In a corner another clerk was seating himself. Zamatov was not there, nor, of course, Nikodim Fomitch. No one in? Raskolnikov asked, addressing the person at the bureau. Whom do you want? Ah! Not a sound was heard, not a sight was seen, but I sent the Russian. How does it go on in the fairy tale? I've forgotten. At your service! A familiar voice cried suddenly. Raskolnikov shuddered. The explosive lieutenant stood before him. He had just come in from the third room. It is the hand of fate, thought Raskolnikov. Why is he here? You've come to see us? What about? cried Ilya Petrovitch. He was obviously in an exceedingly good humor and perhaps a trifle exhilarated. If it's on business, you are rather early. It's only chance that I am here. However, I'll do what I can. I must admit I— What is it? What is it? 
Excuse me. Raskolnikov. Of course, Raskolnikov. You didn't imagine I'd forgotten. Don't think I am like that Rodion... Ro... Ro... Rodionovich? That's it, isn't it? Rodion Romanovich. Yes, yes, of course. Rodion Romanovich. I was just getting at it. I made many inquiries about you. I assure you, I've been genuinely grieved since that... since I behaved like that. It was explained to me afterwards that you were a literary man, and a learned one, too, and so to say the first steps... Mercy on us! What literary or scientific man does not begin by some originality of conduct? My wife and I have the greatest respect for literature. In my wife it's a genuine passion. Literature and art. If only a man is a gentleman, all the rest can be gained by talents, learning, good sense, genius. As for a hat, well, what does a hat matter? I can buy a hat as easily as I can a bun. But what's under the hat, what the hat covers, I can't buy that. I was even meaning to come and apologize to you, but thought maybe you'd— But I am forgetting to ask you, is there anything you want, really? I hear your family have come. Yes, my mother and sister. I've even had the honor and happiness of meeting your sister, a highly cultivated and charming person. I confess I was sorry I got so hot with you. There it is. But as for my looking suspiciously at your fainting fit, that affair has been cleared up splendidly. Bigotry and fanaticism. I understand your indignation. Perhaps you are changing your lodging on account of your family's arriving? No, I only looked in. I came to ask. I thought that I should find Zamatov here. Oh, yes, of course, you've made friends, I heard. Well, no, Zamatov is not here. Yes, we've lost Zamatov. He's not been here since yesterday. He quarreled with everyone on leaving, in the rudest way. He is a feather-headed youngster, that's all. One might have expected something from him, but there, you know what they are, our brilliant young men. He wanted to go in for some examination, but it's only to talk and boast about it. It will go no further than that. Of course, it's a very different matter with you or Mr. Rezumian there, your friend. Your career is an intellectual one, and you won't be deterred by failure. For you, one may say, all the attractions of life nihil est. You are an ascetic, a monk, a hermit. A book, a pen behind your ear, a learned research, that's where your spirit soars. I am that way myself. Have you read Livingstone's travels? No. Oh, I have. There are a great many nihilists about nowadays, you know, and indeed it is not to be wondered at. What sort of days are they, I ask you? But we thought. You are not a nihilist, of course. Answer me openly, openly. No. Believe me, you can speak openly to me as you would to yourself. Official duty is one thing, but— You are thinking I meant to say friendship is quite another? No, you're wrong. It's not friendship, but the feeling of a man and a citizen, the feeling of humanity, and of love for the Almighty. I may be an official, but I am always bound to feel myself a man and a citizen. You are asking about Zamatov. Zamatov will make a scandal in the French style in a house of bad reputation, over a glass of champagne. That's all your Zamatov is good for. Well, I'm perhaps, so to speak, burning with devotion and lofty feelings and besides, I have rank, consequence, a post. I am married and have children. I fulfill the duties of a man and a citizen. But who is he, may I ask? I appeal to you as a man ennobled by education. Then these midwives, too, have become extraordinarily numerous." Raskolnikov raised his eyebrows inquiringly. The words of Ilya Petrovitch, who had obviously been dining, were for the most part a stream of empty sounds for him but some of them he understood. He looked at him inquiringly, not knowing how it would end. "'I mean those crop-headed wenches,' the talkative Ilya Petrovitch continued. "'Midwives is my name for them. I think it a very satisfactory one, ha <laughs> ha! They go to the academy, study anatomy. If I fall ill, am I to send for a young lady to treat me? What do you say, ha <laughs> ha!' Ilya Petrovitch laughed, quite pleased with his own wit. 
It's an immoderate zeal for education, but once you're educated, that's enough. Why abuse it? Why insult honorable people, as that scoundrel Zamatov does? Why did he insult me, I ask you? Look at these suicides, too, how common they are, you can't fancy. People spend their last halfpenny and kill themselves, boys and girls and old people. Only this morning we heard about a gentleman who had just come to town. Neil Pavlich, I say, what was the name of that gentleman who shot himself? Svidrigailov, someone answered from the other room with a drowsy listlessness. Raskolnikov started. Svidrigailov? Svidrigailov has shot himself? he cried. What, do you know Svidrigailov? Yes, I knew him. He hadn't been here long. Yes, that's so. He had lost his wife, was a man of reckless habits, and all of a sudden shot himself, and in such a shocking way. He left in his notebook a few words, that he dies in full possession of his faculties and that no one is to blame for his death. He had money, they say. How did you come to know him? I was acquainted. My sister was governess in his family. Bah, bah, bah! Then no doubt you can tell us something about him. You had no suspicion? I saw him yesterday. He was drinking wine. I knew nothing." Raskolnikov felt as though something had fallen on him and was stifling him. "'You've turned pale again. It's so stuffy here.' "'Yes, I must go,' muttered Raskolnikov. "'Excuse my troubling you.' "'Oh, not at all, as often as you like. It's a pleasure to see you, and I am glad to say so.' Ilya Petrovich held out his hand. I only wanted... I came to see Zamatov. I understand, I understand, and it's a pleasure to see you. I... am very glad. Good-bye." Raskolnikov smiled. He went out. He reeled. He was overtaken with giddiness and did not know what he was doing. He began going down the stairs, supporting himself with his right hand against the wall. He fancied that a porter pushed past him on his way upstairs to the police office, that a dog in the lower story kept up a shrill barking and that a woman flung a rolling pin at it and shouted. He went down and out into the yard. There, not far from the entrance, stood Sonia, pale and horror-stricken. She looked wildly at him. He stood still before her. There was a look of poignant agony, of despair in her face. She clasped her hands. His lips worked in an ugly, meaningless smile. He stood still a minute, grinned, and went back to the police office. Ilya Petrovich had sat down and was rummaging among some papers. Before him stood the same peasant who had pushed by on the stairs. "'Hullo! Back again! Have you left something behind? What's the matter?' Raskolnikov, with white lips and staring eyes, came slowly nearer. He walked right to the table, leaned his hand on it, tried to say something, but could not. Only incoherent sounds were audible. "'You are feeling ill. A chair. Here, sit down. Some water.' Raskolnikov dropped onto a chair, but he kept his eyes fixed on the face of Ilya Petrovich, which expressed unpleasant surprise. Both looked at one another for a minute and waited. Water was brought. It was I," began Raskolnikov. Drink some water. Raskolnikov refused the water with his hand, and softly and brokenly but distinctly said, It was I killed the old pawnbroker woman and her sister Lizaveta with an axe and robbed them. Ilya Petrovich opened his mouth. People ran up on all sides. Raskolnikov repeated his statement. End of Part 6, Chapter 8